So after I've profiled my application's I.O., possibly redesigned the application to do better I.O., and we're talking a little bit about the XFS CTL system call where an application can ask the operating system what that file system's stripe width and stripe unit is so that it can form I.O. requests that match the way the file system was built. So in order to move data around efficiently, I want to be friendly and match the size of all these blocking and these buffers that are going on there. So after I've figured out the application I.O., possibly improved its I.O. to get into larger sequential, I'm then going to decide about my file system design and make sure that my LUN stripe width and my XVM stripe units are configured properly for the nature of the I.O. that I'm trying to do. After that, and again, that's primarily for direct I.O. and for bandwidth reasons. But not everything does direct I.O. So after that, we've got to talk about the page cache. And this is my standard I.O. So I want to talk about active, inactive. I want to talk about dirty and clean. I want to talk about the flush daemon and what it does. I also have to talk about KSwapD here, because KSwapD is managing this stuff. KSwapD is going to trim this cache. So I want to talk about inactive data. If I have time today or tomorrow, I want to look at the swappiness, sysctl vm.swappiness, and see if I can play an experiment there. So there are some key sysctl parameters. This is probably the most common sysctl parameters that the site will go to. And I want to get into monitoring the cache with PCP, top. I want to look at SAR R, and I'm plotting that stuff right now, and PROC MEM info. And we're going to break apart that cached field again into the dirty, right back, NFS unstable, clean, dev sh uh, shamem, IPCS shamem, shared text, and any other tempfs file systems. Now, I have been using BC free a little bit, but one of the other things I want to play with here is the sync command. And you got to be careful on these large memory machines. I, I see, and what we see there, 60 gig of dirty data on your system when we looked. And if I do a sync command on the serial console, I might not have that serial console available to me for a while. The couple other things I want to look at is LSOF to identify open files in the cache and IPCS to look at shared memory that's in the cache field. And we've been doing that for the past couple of days already. So I have been talking about this concept of file system buffer cache. That's kind of an old Unix term. The file system means that I'm writing data to a file system using XFS, extended three, extended four, that there are, are super blocks, directories, and inodes to find where that file is. And these files are journal file systems. And when we get time, I want to come back to that journal tomorrow because I intend to fire up my code fives overnight and see what happens with that workload that we had hanging the system yesterday. Now, the word buffer has different meaning, but to me, a buffer is the right path. The purpose of a buffer is to hold my data until it's sectorized in an appropriate chunk to send off to the next stage. Buffers are also matching speeds between something slow and something fast. So, for example, when I'm at home watching Netflix, it's going to read stuff in from the network and buffer it, and then try to be ahead of that data so that if the network starts slowing down, the data that's in the buffer on my PC can still be playing the movie. Buffers are also used in the write to sectorize the data. And then the third thing was Linux calls buffers also raw I.O., meaning that there's no file system. So for me, the file system is the slab. The buffer to me is the write, and the cache is the reads, ignoring the uh, buff mem. So in IRIX, the slab and the metadata was actually in the cache with everything else. But now the file system is off in the kernel, not in the page cache. Slab top will show you if you've got a lot of metadata in the kernel, as well as the SAR-V option will show you how many directories and inodes are in memory. So the buffer cache has two parts. 
the buffer is for the write traffic, is going to get written to the kernel space to the page cache, and then will be flushed later by the flush daemon. So this is referred to as buffered I.O., dirty I.O., delayed write, because we're going to write to the kernel and let the kernel write it later in a delayed fashion. And one of the advantages to that, by the way, is extended for and XFS have delayed allocation. So they're not going to allocate little pieces at a time. It's going to stall a little bit, which will give the application more time to write more of the file, give the uh, kernel a better opportunity to avoid fragmentation if it has a bigger idea, an idea of how big the file is going to get. So delayed allocation and extent lists are meant to reduce fragmentation and file lookups. And the same thing is also referred to as a lazy write. When I write to cache, I don't have to worry about it being on a sector boundary. The kernel is going to sectorize it. In fact, the smallest you can write from the kernel is your file system block size, which is 4K. So if I write hello mom, the kernel is going to convert that into a 4K by chunk that will go off to the file system for that file. Contained in the cache memory value, we looked at top, but again, top is adding the slab in there, and then proc mem for the mem info. Again, this is dirty data. Once we start actually flushing at the disk, it goes right back and then NF unstable. So dirty data, it, all three are inconsistent. If I take a service interruption, the data is going to be corrupt. But dirty data has not been marked to flush yet. Once we get this delayed right, then we're going to mark it to flush and move it to write back. So write back data is data that is, has been flagged to flush. It's been marked to flush. And then we have NFS unstable for data that was writing to an NFS server. So if I'm writing to an NFS server, it's going to go from user space to dirty, then to write back, then to NFS unstable. And if that server is real, real slow, you might see write backs back up quite high. I don't want to do that. So dirty data when flush to disk becomes coherent or clean. Once the flush is done, it is not released from memory. It still stays in memory. The only thing that's going to get something out of memory right now is either a memory demand forcing the cache to be trimmed or a BC free or removing the file. BC free is just calling a sysctl parameter called drop underscore caches. And that just tells the kernel to trim the cache. But again, the kernel cannot trim anything until we actually flush it. And there is an XFS buff D for XFS that we've been seeing that then sends it to the flush daemon with a major minor number attached to the flush daemon, and that's the right path. So this is file cache coherency. If I write into my page cache, I need the disk to be coherent. Maybe I'm in a... Uh, mission critical situation, I don't want to take a service interruption and lose the data. I need to get it to the platter. We talked briefly, CXFS has to pass tokens to a metadata server in the cluster to make things coherent. I can't have two processes on two different hosts in the cluster writing the same file at the same time, or it'll be alphabet soup. It'll all be scrambled up. There's also a daemon called XFS sync D, and that's what flushes the metadata, the inodes and directories to disk. And again, that's part of the slab, not the buffer cache. The other part of the buffer cache is the cache piece, and that's for reading data, and that's for reuse of data, especially when you need low latency. So again, here was my whole story, latency versus bandwidth. If my assets, if I can hold my assets and read them into cache and grow memory and not have to throw away what I just read, and I can hold everything on that node, I really want latency, I want everything to stay on node. So if my assets fit, I want to tune for latency. If my assets don't fit, like a you know, multi-terabyte video stream or something, I'm going to be busting the memory on the node, then I need to be looking at distribution, round robin, interleaving, things of that sort. Now historically, one of the things that happened here, we'll come back to this, in older Itanium days, an application would come in, read in the file. It was all coming into that one node because the latency or the first touch was bringing it into that node. 
And then the application come along, allocate memory, and the first thing you do is go trim all the cache that it just read in, and now you had to reread reread the data back in again. So what they did was this CPU set memory spread page cache. So that spread it across everything in the CPU set, which reduced the load on the the CPU that the application was running on, spreads it across. And then when the application starts allocating memory, it's not all in one place and has to be thrown out. So that was an example where the assets and the process did not fit on the same node, so they went into a round-robin, interleave, spread type of pattern. So if it fits, latency. Page cache is for latency. If I'm doing large video streams, I don't want to go through the cache, I want to try, and I don't want to copy it from user space to kernel space, that pushes across the interconnect, makes the interconnect busy, creates contention on the interconnect, drives up latency and instructions, memory loads going across the interconnect, and can impact the system. So I want to try to keep it all on node when I am in a latency situation. If I'm not, then I've got to spread it round robin. Let me move on. So we were looking at a more detailed picture here, but we start off with our data. If it's Fortran, it's going to go through a library buffer. And sometimes the data is in the stack if we've got automatic arrays. Then we've got a I.O. operation that occurs from the application. Let's just say I do a write in Fortran or C. That's going to result in a write system call, and that's known as a logical request. So every time I make a read or write system call to the kernel, that's a logical I.O. We were tracking those with S-trace. So with S-trace, I can track my reads and my writes, opens, closes, things of that sort. And a few minutes ago, we were looking at direct I.O. where it was a P-read and a P-write. In between then, we have the page cache. Now, a good page cache, we're going to have high logical and no physical. We'd like to be able to actually avoid any physical I.O. and satisfy everything here. So I keep read, write, read, write, read, write, and satisfy everything out of memory. Never have to go to disk. But if I am writing, at some point, I may have to flush that data with the sync command, a flush statement in Fortran, or if the flush daemon says, I got too much dirty data, or it's been dirty too long, that's going to result in a flush, and now we go to physical I.O. Now, you've got to be a little careful here. So I've seen cases where this is high. We've got lots of logicals, but no physicals, and that would be good. We're not having to go to disk for things. But other times where the logicals are low, but the physicals are high, and what you can get into is a cache thrash where I have to keep reading in the same data over and over again. It's what I call an upside-down cache. The cache isn't caching anything because it can't hold it in cache. And then your physicals end up. So... I read in the file, I do a trim, have to reread the file in, do a trim, reread the file, and I end up thrashing on those physical IOPS. Again, these physicals can be tracked by SAR or block trace. And we were just looking at those, the physical IOPS that were coming out of the kernel. So this is where I was talking about calling it a fire bucket brigade or transmission gears, impedance matching, that sort of thing. And in my opinion, not knowing your I.O., the transmission gears you have geared there have a big jump down when that it hits the stripe unit. So we start large, chunk it down, and then the rate is expecting large again. So it doesn't seem to be geared right, in my opinion. But it was a standard default configuration. you got to know your workload characteristics to make more responsible decisions. And again, in the uh, appendix, I had a cheat sheet that was a little bit more verbose than this, and I will come back to that later. So, clean data and inactive data. Data that's been read from disk or has flushed the disk is clean. Clean data is coherent data. If I take a service interruption, the data is still on disk. The inode might be corrupt, the file system tree might be corrupt still, but the data itself was coherent out on disk. Now, if that clean data is busy for an unknown amount of time, it's then put onto the inactive list. Swappiness is what controls this. How aggressively we rotate the page, put it on a least recently used list, basically age it, and put it on the inactive list. Now, if we're short on memory, K 
K-swap D. K-swap D is going to come in, and the first thing it's going to try to do is trim the slab. So if we're on short in memory, the slab, the metadata, is what we're going to try to trim first. And in there, we're going to try to do, it may vary depending upon how it's set, but we're going to try to do inodes and then directories. And we were seeing that earlier this week when we were, I think it was a uh, DD command that was in a trim, and we caught it with get delays, attached with crash, looked at a stack trace with BT, and saw that it was on an inode situation, trying to trim a slab and dealing with uh, slabs inodes. In your case, you're seeing buffer head. But again, I'd rather buffer head not get big and the cache get too big. It takes time to do the trim. And if it takes too long to do the trim, then the application goes off node. And you have a large slab spread across all the I nodes that look all across all the nodes it look like. So the inactive cache is what released is released first, and then the active is released. If it's a process, the active is swapped. So meminfo breaks out the active and inactive between an on and file. And again, when we looked at yours, we saw almost four terabyte of inactive file page cache. And most of the anon was active. The swappiness up here is going to control the balance between anon and file. Now be careful here again. Let me go to my whiteboard here. Oops, what did I do? No, that's So let's repeat this again. Top, free, SAR, most tools, add the S reclaim, thinking it's reclaimable, of the slab to cached. But in meminfo, Slab is separate, and in that mem cache meminfo field, we have the dirty, and the dirty date was data written by the app. Then we have our write back, which is data marked to flush by the flush daemon. Something like the flush D by percent dirty or age or sink will flush dirty to write back. Now, if I'm writing to an NFS server, the write-back then goes to NFS unstable. Write-back going to NFS server. And some of that write-back data might be NFS data that backs up. So you could have huge write-backs and simply data that hasn't gone from write-back to NFS unstable yet. Now when that stuff is flushed, then it's known as cache underscore clean. Coherent. Now this is not in meminfo derived by PCP. And basically cache clean in PCP is equal to the cached minus the dirty plus the right back. Dirty and right back are not clean. But it needs to subtract the NFS unstable as well. 
At the time this was implemented in PCP, there was no NFS unstable field. Also, should subtract Shemem. I don't want to really call that clean. So when this clean, cash clean was implemented in PCP, there was no NFS unstable or Shemem. Now after cash clean, we also have our shared text. This is your binary. And problem here is a BC free dash A throws this away and then reread. Also now in the cache field is Shemem. And that is going to be your IPCS and your dev Shemem. And that is really a tempfs file system. Any tempfs file system. used is in the cached field. So when I do a BC free, I'm only able to get the cache clean out of there. I can't, and the share text. I can't throw away Shemem. I can swap it out, but I can't trim it. If I, if I am trimming down and I've run out of everything else, shared memory uh, segments are going to get pushed out to swap. I can't free up any dirtier write back or even if it's unstable until that stuff is coherent and clean. So Camille, you were kind of asking about this. I don't have any better drawing in this manual right now. Do you need this slide any longer? I think we're good. I mean, it's in the recording, so we can refer to it. Yeah. Yep. Never trust a recording. Yeah, true enough. But anyway, I've been trying to impress you that all the time. So you, people always say, all my memory's full. It's all cached. You need to pull that cache stuff apart and figure out what the pieces of it are. Yes. Yeah. And that's what I've been trying to do all week. So files write are done with a delayed write buffer. Data is kept in memory for a certain amount of time, and that gives us a delayed allocation capability. 15 seconds for XFS, but then the uh, flush daemon does a 30 second. I want to try to demo that later. I don't know that I'll get to it today, but we'll see. Now here's the problem. If 10% of my memory is dirty, we're going to start flushing, or 30 seconds. 10% of your 16 terabyte machine is 8 terabyte of dirty data. I really don't want 8 terabyte of dirty data to build up on me, and then I have to try to flush it out and deal with it. There's two ends of the spectrum here for me on this flushing or sinking. The one end is what I call a trickle sink. So I'm trickling and flushing the stuff to the disk in the background, trickling it away so that my dirty doesn't get out of control. And the other end of the spectrum is I let too much dirty data and then I try to flush something more, like a terabyte, more than the file system can handle, and now I'm in what I call a flush choke. And I don't want flush chokes. If you've got flush chokes going on, the write backs will be high. Because you've marked stuff to flush, but it's not flushing. So I mentioned one site that had a times 10 in memory resident database that was periodic checkpointing itself to a checkpoint file system, but half their memory was dirty and write back because they were over aggressive on their checkpoints. And their file system wasn't necessarily perfectly designed for it, and they weren't doing direct I.O. Again, on a UV, doing direct I avoids a memory-to-memory -memory transfer that reduces latency, forces the interconnect to be used, and creates contention on the interconnect. So memory is being flushed to disk asynchronously by the flush daemon and this XFS buff D. If I type in the flush command, or the sync command, that flushes all my buffers synchronously. I don't know about your age, but for me in the old days, we do a sync, sync on a shutdown because the syncs were asynchronous there. You do the sync command and you get your prom back right away. Now the syncs are synchronous. In the old days, we do sync, sync for a shutdown to make sure that everything that was in memory was flushed to disk and coherent. And that's also flushing metadata. So if you have a large slab 
the flush is going to have to go to all the inodes and directories there in memory and, and synchronize them. At the programmer level, it's F-Sync. So you might have an application that is forcing the sync to get it out of the mainframe. Now, metadata is flushed differently than data. Metadata is flushed every 30 seconds, no matter what. It's not a percentage of memory dirty threshold. And there's this XFS sync D centiseconds to flush your metadata. In fact, in my scenario, I might want to slow it down, that action item list stuff, to reduce the action item list activity that I saw. So this is just describing the mem info, and again, we're pulling about cache now. I'm not going to do any raw I/O and buffers. I do. This is an old kernel, by the way. I want to get into active and inactive, and then dirty, right back, uh, NFS unstable. The rest of the stuff. Let's see. What don't we care about here? I don't care about any of this here, unless I'm using the huge pages. I don't care about. Well, that's pretty much it. This is user's process space, this is shemem space, this is the kernel space. What you got there? A three gig kernel. Slab info will tell me what that is. Well, what was that kernel, by the way, is unreclaimable. So there's some documentation of the mem info. So buffer cache problem analysis tools. I'm going to look at top and use WCHAN. And we were seeing this the other day, the, the XFS buff locks. I've gone into XFS statistics and there's a group of buffer cache lock or buffer cache statistics in the XFS field. I'm right now got the mem view built and ready. I could just watch cache on proc mem info. I do want to show you an LSOF when I'm filling up a file system. PS-EL for WCHAN. Now sometimes WCHAN is truncated. You don't get all the characters, but if you do dash O WCHAN, or you can do a cat of slash proc, whatever the PID is, WCHAN. And that will give you the full name of it. Or you can go into crash and do a BT on the PID. And that will also show you what the WCHAN would be, but also how you got there. So I might be sleeping on different things, but the backtrace will tell me what was the system call and where did this uh, WCHAN events start from. I don't really care about this, but we're going to look at the IOSTAT disk partitions data. This isn't really relevant anymore. That's just going to map things. This is where we're getting the top disk data from, the NMON data we just saw. And right now I'm not going to deal with the slab. I want to suck that up tomorrow and then see how long it takes to push the slab down. And here's what we were just looking at. I wanted to look at it on a per file system or per node basis. So there is a SAR metric, SAR B. This is really just the totals of proc disk stats. This is the same thing that we have from PCP PM chart with the uh, device. I think it's disk device total or the read and write IOPS. So really just summarizing the PROC disk stacks file, giving you the total number of IO operations that are there. This is out of the elevator again, the block SCSI later. How many were reads, how many were writes, and then how many blocks were was the disk driver handling in terms of blocks read and blocks written? Now what we've been plotting with PCP were the first two. That was the default for the default disk view was these two. No, I'm sorry, these two here. So with PCP I can plot total physical memory. I don't care about use, except like I said, when we were on a per node basis, I can't build a stack bar for every node and be able to look at 256 nodes with eight metrics per node. Just too much data. So the other day I used that on a per node basis. And then another plot for a per node free. Then we have the cache field. That's the one that I've been pulling apart all week. Then I have the buff mem. 
And then I have other. Other I don't ever use. That's what matches free. Other was basically used minus cash. It's the user space plus the kernel space. It's anything that is not the cash field. Then we're going to look at active and inactive. We worry about page tables later. Here's the key ones now. Dirty, right back. My process space. My shemem. If you're making notes, that's attached IPCS. Attach shared memory segments. It says M mapped here, that's really not true. It is my node. If you do a memhog, memhog does things mapped, but it never shows up in the mapped field here. It shows up in the anon pages. So I'm going to get rid of that M. And here again, cache clean, PCP derived was cache minus the dirty plus write back. Because those are not clean. But it needs to add in NFS and Shemem. Those were not available at the time that this derived metric was put into PCP. I'm trying to get it something similar to what IRIX had. So this is the game we're going to start playing now. So I'm going to do some I.O. through the cache. Now before break we were looking at both direct and cached. Now this is a real old sample because at the time cache clean was not available here. This would have been cache clean, but PCP did not give me that data yet. But I kind of like to keep this chart around because it looks interesting to me. So I don't care, but something was writing. I see some the reds are my dirty my right back. So I see some right backs going on in here. The blues are my dirty. So there's some sort of IO started here. And then at this point I started my application. And by the way, this I.O. of this up here was clean, so we were reading a file in at this point, and then the file was trimmed or thrown away from the cache at this point, was given up. But let me fill that piece of the chart in with cache clean. Then we started running the application again, and right in here, it started going from dirty to right back. That is basically your dirty background ratio. And then it started growing on the system, and again, the reds are the right backs, and at some point it stopped growing because it hit dirty ratio. You cannot have more dirty data, more dirty right back data than dirty ratio allows. So right there I can see a flush. Here's another flush, here's another flush, here's another flush. See the stairs? See the step ladder there? So it woke up and what it saw as aged got flushed there. It woke up here, said here's what's aged, marked it to flush, and then it flushed. These are the wake up points for the flush demon. The flush demon has a wake up interval. And you can sometimes see that wake up interval in the data here. Now I was also doing that VM stat statistics that we were looking at earlier, so I was trying to plot a bunch of them. And I happened to catch a page activate here and a page, in this case, a page deactivate. So there's some pages being activated in here, and then there's an activate and a deactivate. So deactivating a page is making it inactive, aging it. And I was trying to track some other things in here, slabs being scanned and stuff, but it doesn't look like I had any trims going on. And I can see the activates and deactivates here. And then there's also, I'm suspecting that that is page rotate. I can't tell if it's that blue or this blue right now. Uh, it's before the green. It probably is this blue here. Because the way these stack up, this is going to be the first one, the second one. This is underneath green. So it must be the K-Swap D steal. Stealing pages from something. I'm also looking at page allocates. Direct DMA, again, the direct DMA is now direct normal. I don't know why, but the current kernel I have, now everything is under normal, not DMA. So here I can see some uh, reds, which was the direct DMA. Let me clean this. So I can see here the red is a direct DMA scan, 
and the blue is a what's called page refill. And I got some yellows here where it's again allocating. So the yellow is showing page allocation here, and we can see the page is being allocated. Doesn't look like there are any stalls, but one problem I need to warn you about here is look at the range up here. So these things are burying this. This would probably be better off on a separate chart because it might be buried down in the noise and we can't see it down in here. So here's the same sort of thing, and I'm going to do this live. I see the uh, slab down here. I see the dirty going, and then at some point it got as dirty as it could, and the blues are my cash clean, and riding on top of this right here are my right backs. You should not see right backs just barely like that. So the data here is going from the dirty into this right back and then from right back to clean. And I can see a flush occurred here and a flush occurred here. And then it stopped. So this is the important part. These are the SysCTL parameters and I've already advised you to look at dirty background ratio, dirty ratio, swappiness, and page cache limit megabyte. I don't want my dirty to get too big. I don't want my page cache to get too big. Both tie up memory. And I also want swappiness so that I protect my process space and am more aggressive at trimming the inactive portion of the cache. And from your case, you have four terabyte of inactive file cache. So let's go through these. Dirty background ratio. This is the point in which the flush daemon starts flushing. By default, I need 10% of my memory dirty before I start flushing. So on your system, that'd be 1.6 terabyte of dirty data before I start worrying about it. And I could get up to 8 terabyte of dirty data before I stop the writes. And eight terabyte of dirty data would be a little bit of a trouble to deal with. We generally try to try to keep this dirty and right back low. I passed the uh, luster configurations to the luster person, and he, he didn't like luster having the luster's dirty ratio or dirty bytes at half of memory either at eight terabyte. So you need to watch for that if you're getting a lot of dirty data. So I'm going to start the disk activity at dirty background ratio, but the uh, process will continue. It's asynchronous I.O. The process will continue writing. But then when we hit dirty ratio, the process is put to sleep and my writes become synchronous, not asynchronous. So by default, when 40% of my memory is dirty, processes will put to be put to sleep. So the flush team is saying, okay, 10% of my memory is dirty. I better start flushing it up and cleaning up so that it doesn't get too dirty. I don't want my house to get too dirty. But then when it got up to 40%, it said, oh, I am way too dirty. I've got to do something. Stop writing data. Stop shoving data down my throat. Put the processes to sleep. You don't want more than 40% of your memory dirty. The maximum it can go is 50 and background ratio, the least it can go is five. So for your information, we now have it by bytes, not in this table. But I can specify it by bytes instead of uh, percentage. Now, this is that step ladder that we were looking at, those steps. This is how often the flush demon is going to wake up and decide, okay, am I over a certain dirty? And do I have anything that's too dirty? Been dirty too long. So every five seconds, the flush demon is going to wake up and sort out what's going on. And I don't want that flush demon to be waking up too quickly. I'd just rather have it worrying about it by dropping both of these thresholds down. Again, I would typically set that to 5 and set this to 10. But on a machine that's as big as yours, I might be using by bytes to get it even smaller. The next one here, dirty expire centiseconds. So this is set to 30,000 by default, which says if the date is older than 30 seconds, flush it. Then we've got something called VFS cache pressure. 
I wouldn't worry about this right now. Leave it alone, but this is the difference between the slab and the cache. I see no reason on your system to adjust it. If I drop, it's at 100 by default. If I drop it less than 100, I'm going to protect my slab and trim my cache. Okay, and in your case, I probably would not do that because most of your slab is the cache. If you trim the cache, that buffer underscore head should get smaller. If it's greater than 100, that says trim the slab and protect the cache. So this thing is deciding which is more important, the slab or the cache. Swappiness is determining which is more important, the process or the cache. So swappiness says, how aggressively do we swap? The higher the number, the more aggressive the swapping. The lower the number, the more aggressive the trim. So if I set swappiness to a zero, I am protecting my process space and I'm going to trim the cache. If I set it to 100, I'm going to protect the cache and trim the process space. Now the default is 60, which kind of makes sense in my laptop. I've got web browsers and other apps that have been iconized and haven't been used in a couple of days. Go ahead and let it take care of that space. But I'm constantly hitting the web and the stuff that's in the cache, I might want more to protect it. So I'm okay with the 60 on my laptop, but not in a, uh, PC, not in a HPC market like we have here. So I want to try to play with that swappiness. It only comes into play, these two here are only coming into play when you do a trim. And that SAR little b and VM stats will tell me how much trims you're doing. The other one that you should not be touching is zone reclaim mode. I've got a site right now that zone re reclaim mode has been set to a zero. Zero says no reclaim mode. In other words, when it's a zero, it's not going to be a no to wear trim. So I don't know what's going on with the site for sure, but they have they have the KSwap D constantly coming in. So if KSwap D comes in on a node and says this node's out of memory, it's going to recover memory across the architecture, not on that node. And then the application keeps growing and says, why well, didn't get enough recovered from this node? So then it does another reclaim trim, which does across the system but doesn't recover enough for that particular process. The default should be a zone reclaim on. What this means is when I need memory, I trim on the node where I need the memory. That is going to ensure also that all of your uh, memory allocations are going to be on node and on socket. There's another one, two says reclaim write dirty pages out. And then a four says, reclaim any swap pages. Anything that's out on swap, get rid of them. One is our default. Now we also have, besides this dirty expire centiseconds, we have XFS's centiseconds. Uh, dirt age, data flush by age, and that one is set to 15 seconds. This one is set to 30 seconds. I'm going to take a break coming up here, and then we'll come back and do some of this as a demo. And I'm going to try to write dirty data, but keep it under the 10% so that I never flush by dirty, and then see how long it takes for that to flush. When it starts flushing, I'm going to look for disk I.O. operations. There's also another one here to say how often do I wake up to uh, flush data? How often do I wake up? And then there's the metadata flush. This is the 30 seconds. So if I am in an email spam attack situation, I don't want to flush these inodes too quickly because they're going to get, you get some inodes that are used for synchronization in mail handling. And then it removes the inode as a lock flag, removes it when the transfer is done. So I would normally not be shortening that or lengthening that. We also have min slab ratio. Now this one's bothering me. These days it's 5%. But I've been seeing a lot of kernels, you know, on your system, your, is your slab 5% or more of the total 16 terabytes you have? I've been seeing situations where the slab gets too big. And again, when I run out of memory, I'm going to trim the slab first. 
So I don't like big kernels because they are very inefficient in their trim. And then the last thing is this page cache limit. Now, word of warning, I'm going to look for this, but it was actually twice the set value. So for me, if I said I wanted to keep it at, at a gigabyte, it was actually doing it to two gigabyte. And I want to test that with the latest kernel. And then there's also a page cache limit that says don't count the dirty in that limit. That way the, the clean can still be using things and have a limit of its own without somebody polluting my system with dirty and taking half of the memory as dirty. But I generally would not want, to, uh, well anyway, we'll take a look at that whether I want to ignore dirty or not. But I don't want the cache to get too big. I don't want the dirty to get too big. So when I run out of memory, we're going to push the slab, inos first, then directories. We were seeing that early in the week. I happened to catch that DD attached with get delay, saw it in the trim weight, went to crash, and saw it was trimming inodes. After that, it will trim buff mem. Then it's going to trim all the inactive. Then it's going to trim the active, and then it's going to swap. So when I'm trimming, I'm going to have the inactive thrown away first. So the data kind of goes dirty to a clean. Sync, a close, or a flush is going to move it from dirty to clean. Then swapping it says how quickly we move it from clean to inactive. And then when we have a trim going on or the file is deleted, it will be removed from the cache and gone. And again, hitting the slab first is, is a, an issue when you have a big slab. So here's the drawing that I'm going to try to emulate with PM chart after break. Over, I've got a little font problem here, but over on the left is the memory percentage. Down on the bottom is time domain. I have a dirty background ratio here set at 10, and I have a dirty ratio set at 40, and the maximum that dirty ratio can go is 50, and the lowest that dirty background can go to is 5. So at this point, the process started writing dirty data. Now there is no disk activity until you hit that dirty background ratio. And this is when the flushing starts. We start flagging write backs and disk starts. We start seeing the disk go busy. So at that point, this dirty data is now moving into this write back area here. And then when it flushes, it goes from right back into clean. So this is a stack bar with this being the dirty, this being the right back, and this being the clean. And then this up here was the free. So at some point, I get to my dirty ratio. In this case, it's kind of skewed off here, but that's my 40%. And this is the wake up. So here's the PD flush demon or the flush demon waking up and saying, okay, let's flush stuff. So it wakes up here. This interval is typically the right back centiseconds. How often does the demon wake up? <clears throat> so we see it wake up, mark things to flush, and then they flush. Wake up, mark things to flush, and then they flush. Wake up, mark things to flush, and then they flush. Looks like the flushing stopped here, or at least the right backs weren't visible in my drawing. And then we stopped once we got back below 10%. And then it can stay dirty until we hit dirty expired centiseconds where we get a flush. So questions on this drawing? We've been seeing it in PM chart a couple of times, but now I want to actually drive it up and start writing gigabyte files and reading gigabyte files and doing everything through cache. Up to now, most of the I.O. has been metadata with large slabs. Any questions? So here was another example. Yellow is dirty. It started dirty here. And look right here, when we hit that dirty background ratio is when the disk activity started. We see the right backs going on. And it's going from dirty to right back to clean. 
and page cash limit can set the maximum that the page cash can grow to. Looks like the IO is done here, the right stop, no more dirty. So we're getting from dirty to right back to clean. And it looks like it stopped flushing at this point when we got back below 10%. And we can actually see the disk traffic stopped at that point. I have a question. Go ahead. Why would the system ever stop flushing, like doing the write backs at 10%? Why wouldn't it just uh, write all the changes that were done if the disk system isn't being busy? Well, this is a delayed write system, so it just doesn't deal with it if it's less than 10% until it hits age. When it hits 30 seconds, that's going to flush it again. Oh, okay. So th there is a mechanism too. Yes, it'll flush at age. Dirty expires sent to seconds. 30 seconds by default. But it's trying okay. not to be over aggressive on the flush. Well, if we're doing read, write, read, write. Yes. Or using the delayed write capability, we just didn't want to flush everything. We're trying to keep it a little bit in memory so we get a better idea of how big it's going to be, which gives it a better way of allocating more contiguously. Right. Now, if I did a sync right here, that would flush it. That would continue and flush the rest. Okay? Makes sense. Now, this is actually from an experiment that I did back in the SLES 10 early days, and the flush by age was actually broken. And I sat in a class and watched all my machine go dirty. 100% of my memory went dirty, and none of it was flushing. And that got fixed in like the SLES 9 or SLES 10 kernels. I just keep this chart around. But these behaviors are not always going to be predictable. Sometimes I might see the slab get trimmed, and you just see it trimmed down to nothing, and it doesn't stop. Okay. If the application does a flush or a sync internally, or I do a sync command, that will also result in it flushing. Uh, again, in I these examples, question. I'm only writing one file. I don't have multiple files in contention between files. I have another so it question. will eventually flush by age. Anything um, else? Yes. Was what happens question? when you have a uh, CPU set here? It's going to be contained within the CPU set. But do those, do those ratios all apply within a CPU set? No, unfortunately they don't, which means I can fill up my CPU set with all dirty. But K swap D may come in on a, on a per socket basis, basis and have to deal with it. But that has been a request I've been asking is to be able to have flush control on a CPU set basis so I don't fill up my entire CPU set with dirty and then choke myself and I can't do anything in that CPU set until the flush is done. So I do consider that to be a problem that needs to be addressed. Again, I don't want the dirty to get ahead of me. And 10% of your 16 terabyte, 1.6 terabyte. So if I had a terabyte CPU set and tried to do I.O. in it, I could fill up the entire thing with dirty and choke myself, get into a flush choke situation. Okay? But no, that's system-wide, not on a per CPU set basis. K-swap D, again, may come in and deal with things on a per node basis when a socket runs out of memory. And you'll see K-swap D pop up. Okay, let's move on. So just trying to wrap things up with the slides and then we'll take a break. VNodes is a virtual file system pointer. It doesn't care whether it's NFS or something else. There's a command called LSOF that prints your open file table. Again, uh, you have to be careful. This stuff won't show raw I.O. for things like XFSDB repair, things like that. And I've had cases where FUser and LSOF did not catch RM. And by the way, in the prior example, if I removed the file and it still had a terabyte of dirty data, the file disk space, the inode may go away, but the disk space is not recovered until the flush is finished. And I want to try to demonstrate that. So you're sitting there, file system full, you find the file, you remove it, you're not getting space back. You need to do that sync command and do something to get that data out of memory, flush it so that it can get removed. They don't cancel that stuff. So PCP, we didn't really look at these yet, but a number of I know is how many are active, allocated, how many calls we got. 
I don't really care a whole bunch of these. The reclaims I was interested in, these are more for the engineer when they're really down into the details. I don't usually use them. But these are the ones that I was seeing yesterday with that huge slab problem. So I was seeing us doing get buff call, trying to get a page cache buffer. And I'm hoping that it can be found. But we were seeing a lot that were, I think it was a get locked or a miss locked. Number of requests for a locked page buff, but succeeded. Or miss locked, number of requests for a lock, but failed because there was no page buff. I want to see if we get these tomorrow when I fire up those code fives again. Or the buffer pack cache, the page cache could be busy locked. Maybe it's dirty and has to flush. And then there's also one called get underscore read. I just threw all these into one plot and then looked to see if there was any correlation between them and what we were seeing in the other PCP statistics for that uh, I know situation that we saw yesterday. So, this is what some people do not like. Some people will run BC free periodically, even from a cron event, to keep the page cache from getting too big. All of memory can be used for cache. A lot of our customers came from IRIX. IRIX would throw things away after it's been aged. So all the memory can be used for cache. System's been idle for a couple of days, you look at it and all your memory's gone. You go, where'd all the memory go? That's why I spent time pulling apart the dirty, the right back, NFS unstable, stuff like that. Now the page cache is allocated round robin across the nodes within the CPU set. And this is set by those memory spread page cache in the CPU sets. And again, you may want local allocation and local trim. The uh, database engine here is a 1024 CPU system with like 32 terabyte of data, and they want the times 10 database to have all of its shared memory segments on that node, all the IPCS to be on that node. And they want they don't want their page cache round robin, so they drop them to zero. Again, there's an active and inactive portion of the cache. The inactive is what we're going to throw away first when we trim. This is a bug. The default is mem hard wall of a zero, which says the page cache will not be contained within the CPU set. But I have not been able to break out of my CPU set with the slab or the page cache. If that were set to a zero and it worked, my dirty and my slab should be able to break out of my page cache, a break out of my CPU set. And I want to prove that's not working when I get a chance, probably tomorrow. I've got a long-standing bug on that one. Now, I kind of like this. I really don't want things breaking out of my CPU set. I don't want somebody putting dirty into somebody else's node that's outside their CPU set. So let me just give you a story here, 20-year-old story, really. Cray Unicos had a tool called LD Cache. And LD Cache would partition the page cache on a per-file system basis. So you could say, put 1,000 buffers on scratch, put 10,000 on work, and specify how big and what the page size of the cache page buffers are on a per file system basis. So the site would be running an application and say, OK, I'm in a LD cache configuration, but my statistics are looking terrible. And that's because the application is being contained within that partition of the the page cache and not able to break out of it. So it's bad for it, good for everyone else. Then they said, okay, but when I take LD cache off, the statistics look good, but my response goes terrible. What's happening there now is that application was able to use all the page cache, create contention, dominate the memory, dominate the cache, marooning the interactive user. The numbers look good because it was doing good. But my interactive response was terrible because I became marooned because of the domination of that application. So I do like having the slab and the uh, page cache contained within that CPU set, but that's only writes. If somebody else reads into their CPU set a file and then I want the file, I will get it out of their CPU set. If they come in and load a DSO, and I need that DSO, and that's where it is, I will be going to their CPU set to get the read portion of the cache. 
So I can still read, I just can't allocate outside my CPU set. So I prefer Hardwall to be a one to box things in. Bad for it, good for everyone else. Okay? Questions? So I was using the Node Info and the PCP Mem NUMA statistics to look at this. The memory is given up. First of all, when processes need memory, we can't release dirty or busy. And again, zone reclaims at a one says make it NUMA aware. The second thing, when the application removes or unlinks the file. Now in IRIX, when you close the file that was thrown away, but now it, when we close it, it stays in memory because someone else may come along and open it. The Linux community simply says, why waste memory? If we, if we read it in, let's just keep it in memory and cache it. Problem being is if I, have, if I get a 32 gig cache in there, the size of buffer head and the time it takes to trim everything becomes a problem. Third way we trim the cache is with BC free. And that is actually again a sysctl-w on vm dot drop underscore caches. A one is the page cache. And a two is the slab. Three is both. Now BC Free is doing some other things as well. You can only be root to write into this thing, so it checks to see if you're root or not. And if you're not root, it can't tell the kernel to drop caches. So BC Free will spawn off that program I've been using, Memhog. It will use Memhog to force a trim to push everything down. And again, this is another reason some sites might have a BC free before their job starts, to make sure that everything on the nodes that was given to them has been gotten off that node. There's also the ability, uh, PBS Pro uses page migration to move pages off of a node. So if I've got a job that's using a node, and then preemption comes along and says, you're put to sleep, I've got a higher priority job, we don't have checkpoint there, so it's put to sleep or suspended, and then all this stuff gets squeezed off the node, but I'd rather actually move it off the node before I give it to the next job. So that's called page migration. The last thing is when I open up the file, I can specify with an F advice, I don't need this file. When I close it, throw away the memory footprint. But other than that, top is going to show things topped off. If somebody logs in and says, I just booted the system, haven't used it in a week, yet all my memory is gone. Where did it go? So BC free, a dash A for all nodes, dash N for node number, and then it has to use memhog. We can't do it on a per node basis. The current Linux community felt that the trimming should be quick enough in the prior SUSE Novell implementation, we could actually write a node number and say trim on this node. But the latest community did not go with that solution. So we have to use memhog to trim on a particular node. I don't want to impact and run BC free and have somebody else that's running there and throw all their data in memory away again and have them reread it from disk. There's an S to flush the dirty, and there's an F to release the slab. Again, calls to drop caches, one is for page cache, two is for slab, three is both. You need to be root to flush the whole thing. I shouldn't say flush. That's, that would be a bad thing to drop. Anybody can run the sync command, and that's going to impact everybody on the system. Sync is not NUMA aware. And again, on a per node trim, we use memhog to push things. So uh, there are cases where I want BC free, but I do not like it periodically in a cron event. I'd rather keep the page cache from growing too big. So here we're just showing a dirty being written. I'm going to demonstrate the slide. Dirty right back. We're looking at the VM stat statistics. I don't have cache clean in PCP yet. We can see the write backs occurring. 
the wake-ups of the flush demon. And then when the whole program was done, in this case, it unlinked and removed the file when it was done. And then we see all the pages being freed from that cache. And then all my memory went free. Now, this is something that I was showing you. We're almost ready for a break here. LSOF, uh, people do it different ways, but primarily I want to do a numerical sort, reverse it, and look at column seven. So what I'm trying to do is if a file is open, I can sort by the size of the file and get an idea if I've got a file system filling up, what that file is, and then I can find the file. On IRIX, there is a tool called BuffView. This is the closest thing I have to BuffView. So I wish that I had a BuffView on IRIX so that when somebody comes in and says, you got eight terabyte of dirty data, I'm sorry, eight terabyte of cache, pop up BuffView and tell you what the names of the files are that are in the cache and whether those are assets that are important to you or things that should be thrown away. Don't have that on Linux. But it was a top view. You could actually see a file read into the page cache and watch buff view show the page, the file grow in the cache. So some of the common problems, first of all, is write pollution. This is when you have a lot of dirty data. Again, I try to tell people the the page cache is a public swimming pool. Anybody can do what they want in the water. I don't want somebody polluting my water. I want my own swimming pool. And that's what a CPU set will give you. So if I'm on a wide open system and read in a 100 gig file, somebody comes in and writes a 100 gig file, what I read in might have been lost, and now i got to read, read mine in. The other spectrum is a flush choke. This is when I let my data get my dirty data gets too big, and my flushing cannot keep up with the file system. And that shows up as write-backs backing up, particularly if I'm writing to like an NFS server. The other kind of buffer cache problem, the buff you showed to me, show this to me nicely. This is what I call an upside-down cache. Purpose of a cache is to avoid the physicals. We want to keep it in memory. If the physicals are larger than the logicals, that generally meaning that I've got a lot of physical activity, and that generally means I'm not able to hold a file in memory, and I keep going back to disk to read it in. So I, I read it in, I allocate memory and trim it. Now I need again, read it in, grow, trim, read, grow, trim. And I keep rereading that thing back into memory. And that's when the physicals are going to be bigger than the logicals, and that's not good. The cache is not caching things because what you're trying to hold in cache doesn't fit in cache. It keeps getting trimmed. The other common event, and we were getting into this this week, cache domination. In fact, we couldn't even get a page cache buffer to hold the bash shell. So when I'm in a memory pressure situation, it's not the swap I.O., it's not necessarily the oom killer, it's the fact that my Anon pages has pushed the cache down to zero. And the executables are in the cache field, not in the Anon field. So they've been squeezed out. Now I'm trying to get that executable back into memory. But I've got pressure because the Anons are keeping me pushed down. There's no breathing room there. So Anon and Maps has pushed the cache to zero, thrown away my bash shell, and now there's no breathing room to bring the cache, bring the bash shell back in. Linux really needs a, a min page cache limit, a floor to the page cache saying, don't trim it to zero, trim it down to 100 meg or something. Anything to leave room for those shared text. And we were going through that this week when I pushed and started pushing the swap and my cache was down to zero and I was getting very poor response because the bash shell was not being kept in memory anymore. And one last thing, a core dump storm. If you have core uses PID and you're going uh, 1,024 threads wide, you're going to get 1,024 cores dumped into that current working directory. There is a limit command to prevent that core size from getting too big.
But your system is going to stall out in that situation, just like it would stall out in an OOM situation where the sysctl daemon is being stormed and has to write stuff to var log messages. And you're sitting there waiting for your system to come back. Occasionally, the top comes up and you see syslog at the top. Unfortunately, without buff view, there's no way to spot that a core dump storm is going on that I know of because it's being written by the kernel. So the LSOF won't show that. So solve your disk and file systems problems first. If my disks are slow or designed poorly, it's going to back up into my cache. Again, I have cases where the disks are poorly designed and high SAR-D data, but the applications are not waiting on I.O. because they are being satisfied by the page cache, and maybe the flush daemon is taking care of things in the background behind the scene of the application. Bottom line matters is how much time did you wait on I.O.? And get delays tracks that. Cache by default can take all of memory. Dirty can take up to 50. I want to play a, a demo here with page cache limit. Lower your dirty ratio and keep the flush ahead of the writes. I had one site that did the exact wrong thing though, and this is kind of a bad note here. They dropped dirty ratio below dirty background. So dirty background was still at 10, but they dropped dirty ratio to 5. What do you think that would do? When we hit dirty ratio, everything goes to sleep. So by dropping it before the background ratio, when we hit that threshold, everything would be put to sleep waiting for the I.O. to finish. You want the dirty ratio to be bigger than dirty background ratio. And, and he's sitting there describing over their phone what's going on, and the inventory clearly showed that they'd done that, set that wrong. And they were hitting the synchronous right before they were hitting the asynchronous right. And then everything stalled out huge I.O. wait time as the flush occurred. But the flush became synchronous. So by dropping dirty ratio below dirty background, you're going to end up with synchronous writes much more quickly. Anyway, BC Free can release the cache. Memhog is used as well. Flush Deem is what writes dirty data to disk. Remember, major minor numbers are on the Flush Demon's name. So if you see Flush Demon showing up, you can map it to the file system and then figure out what file system that is, and then with F user, find what's in the file system. IO top, find out what application is doing it, and then uh, attach to it with S trace and find out where the IO is coming from. Trace it back. So again, flush chokes when the prior flush is not done yet. Dropping NR requests down can help throttle some of that stuff. I do not advise you changing NR requests. For a while, there was a 1024, and in my lab, for demo reasons, I'm going to increase NR requests, which will give me more write-backs. But again, that's going to push me into a flush choke situation. And I have to sort NR requests. So instead of sorting 128, I'm sorting 1024, for example. Now, you can always add more memory, but that's a never-ending return. All the memory will always be used. There's no ceiling by default. I want to set one. So. I'm at 3 o'clock your time. Let's take a 15-minute break. Come back at quarter after. Okay. Now and then we'll go to demo.